As you know, a closed class as we conduct it is a most unusual experience. In fact, I do not know of any other such activity on the globe anywhere at the present time. And uh, until students begin to understand that, they do not really benefit from this work to the fullest extent. Now, the reason that we call this a closed class is that the class is closed. That sounds almost too simple to explain, but it is necessary. <clears throat> the class is closed the very moment it opens on Monday evening, and it remains closed until its close on Saturday evening. None may enter the class after it has opened as of this moment. No others may come in for any reason, for any reason whatsoever. This class is closed. All closed classes are closed as of this moment. It is expected that all students have made preparations for attendance at every session. It has been said in previous classes that no one will be excused during the week even to die. If you must die, wait until the class is closed. For we have serious business here, and it will be helpful to you even if you are going to make the transition. There is undoubtedly something here that you must carry with you. Again, you will notice that students are asked to be here at least 15 minutes before our opening for the purpose of meditation. And again, the reason for this meditation is actually symbolic of the entire way of infinite way life. And I will illustrate that for you. That which brought the infinite way into existence was the realization or revelation that was given to me on the inner plane that in order to be at one with anything or anyone in the visible realm, to be at one with any form of good, it becomes necessary, first of all, to become one, consciously one, with the source of all being. Now try to visualize this, that if I humanly want success in life, I have to battle the whole world for it. There are four billion other people in the world, all battling for success. In any walk of life there is competition, and you are always battling competition, whether you are in business or in profession 
in politics, in government, in art, in literature, you are always competing with many, many others in that same line of activity. But it isn't necessary. It is only so because we have not learned to consciously contact or become one with our source. When we become one with our source, we become one with all that is necessary in our experience. In other words, without taking thought what we shall eat or what we shall drink or wherewithal we shall be clothed, by seeking the kingdom of God, that is, conscious oneness with our source, we are at one with the infinite wisdom that already knows our need and the divine love whose good pleasure it is to give us the kingdom. Therefore, we now live not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. Now, in uh, undertaking a study, whether it is a spiritual study or a mathematical study or a scientific study or musical study, art, literature, whatever it may be, if you undertake it on your own, you have only your own state of consciousness, your own state of intelligence, your own education, your own degree of ability with which to succeed. But if you first tune in to the infinite invisible, the life stream, the source of all being, God. You then have the mind of God, the wisdom of God, the love of God, the life of God, the intelligence of God, so that you can say with Paul, I live, yet not I, Christ liveth my life. In other words, you now have a wisdom beyond the human. You have the capacity of an education beyond your schooling. You have a capacity for understanding, for assimilating beyond that which you possibly could have had as an ordinary human being on your own. The Master literally said, I can of my own self do nothing. The Father within me doeth the works. And you could say, and I can say, I cannot learn, I cannot assimilate, I cannot understand, I cannot grasp. But the Father within me can. But remember, there is no father within you until you have consciously made your contact with your source, which is God. That is why the human race is cut off from God, it is not under the law of God, neither indeed can be. That is why we humanly can make mistakes. That is why we have bankruptcies in business. That is why we have failures in marriage. That is why we have incompetency in art and literature and music and commerce. Why? Because we are doing it on our own, separate and apart from God and we do not have the inspiration of God. We do not have the spiritual wisdom of God. We do not have 
the spiritual meat, wine, water. So it is. When we are one with the vine, we bear fruit richly. When we are consciously one with God, when the Spirit of God dwells in us, then do we have the whole wisdom of God flowing through us. We have the strength of God flowing through us. We are not dependent on our physical strength alone. We are not dependent on our education alone. We are not dependent on physical health alone, nor are we the victims of climate or weather or infection or contagion to the same degree once we have opened ourselves to a conscious oneness with God. Now the entire fabric of this message is in its teaching of meditation, of practicing the presence, of attaining conscious oneness with God. It all goes back, as you know, to my own experience in the beginning when I also was in business with only my own experience and mentality and had successes and failures. I had only my own human way of life until that one experience Experience of conscious contact and a whole new dimension of life was open to me. And all of a sudden I began to know things that I had not learned out of books. I had a health that I had never before known in my entire life up to that time. I had a wisdom that was not my own. I had uh, the healing power that was not my own. All of these things began to flow in and through my experience after the experience of conscious union with God, conscious oneness, that moment of light and inspiration which has been described to us through the experience of Saul of Tarsus that made him into St. Paul. <coughs> now then, do not believe for a moment that the study of books is going to lift you into the kingdom of God. It is your conscious oneness with God that is going to do that. The books are merely going to be helps along the way. Now, to undertake the study of the books without first meditating is virtually saying, God, I'm going to read spiritual truth with my brain and expect to understand it. Whereas we read the wisdom of God, the things of God, are foolishness with man. And therefore, to attempt to understand a spiritual message without first contacting the mind of God is foolishness. You will never rightly understand a spiritual message with your human intellect. The things of God are foolishness with man, with the brain, with the human mind, with the reasoning mind. Therefore, before reading, before attempting to study, meditate. Be sure that you feel that inner contact, even if it's a momentary thing, even if it's just that deep breath. Then open your books and you will find that the secret of the books is not in the words but between the lines. 
you will find that the words do not convey meaning to you, but you receive a meaning which the words themselves could never impart. So it is that when we come together in lectures or classes, we unite first with God. In uniting with God, we unite with each other because in our oneness with the mind of God, we are one with the mind of each other. The spiritual mind, not the human mind, not the selfish mind, not the sensual mind. Who wants to be in contact with that? Mind readers do it, and they are sorry for it. Many on the occult path do it, and they're sorry for it. No one wants to engage in transference of thought. No one in this work wants to engage in reading each other's minds. All that we want is to be consciously one with the mind of God, then we are consciously one with the spiritual mind of each other. In other words, then, when you, through meditation, feel that inner click, that deep breath, it means you are now in contact with that mind which was also in Christ Jesus. But remember, that is my teaching mind and my healing mind. I do not teach with the brain. I certainly do not teach with education. I do not teach with things that I've learned out of books. I teach only with spiritual impartation that comes spontaneously with each lecture and with each class. Therefore, when you have touched the mind of God, you have touched that mind of me, which is the teacher and the healer. Therefore, when I speak to you as I am now and uh, speaking through that mind which was in Christ Jesus, you through that same mind are receiving and responding and you are assimilating the truth that is flowing into your God awareness from my God awareness, for we are one. And we are demonstrating what the Master said. I am in my Father. My Father is in me. You are in me, and I am in you. For we are one in Christ. This is not true of us as human beings. This is not true of the human world. This is only true in the experience of those who have touched that mind that was in Christ Jesus. And they can only do it through meditation. They can only do it through opening their consciousness to the inflow of the divine spirit. But then, as you will realize, more especially those of you who have ever studied metaphysical notes, which I understand in August will make its appearance here in England under the title of Conscious Union with God. You will find that the theme of that particular class, and the book actually was a class, a class which was recorded. And the theme of that class is my conscious oneness with God constitutes my oneness with all spiritual being and idea. And you see what happens. In my conscious oneness with God, the book The Infinite Way appeared, was written, was published. But I was living in California, 
and only 2,000 copies of that book were printed, and it was never offered to anyone except those who came to me in my office as patients or students. And yet, a woman whom I have met less than a half a dozen times in my entire lifetime found this book, thought so well of it that she decided to send a copy to Henry Thomas Hamblin. Mr. Hamblin liked it so well that he was inspired to write an article which he called The Infinite Way. And in it, he gave his reaction to the book and said that this teaching is the first one in 2,000 years to reveal the Christ message. And that article of his created such a demand for the infinite way that your very great publishing house of George Allen and Unwin wrote to California and asked if they could publish the infinite way in a British edition. Can you imagine George Allen and Unwin writing to you, could they publish your book? No more could I visualize such a thing happening to me, nor could I make it happen any more than you could make it happen. But they received permission, and they published it, and Mr. Hamblin was the first one to buy a thousand copies of them. So great was the demand. Now, the point that I'm making to you, I'm really not giving you a testimony. The point that I'm making to you is that as a human being, I had nothing to do with the publication in England of the infinite way. And therefore, I had nothing to do as a human being with all that you have witnessed in the eight years since I have been coming to England. It all took place without any human aid from me or any human mental work or praying. For who can ever dream of praying for such an experience? No, because of my conscious contact with God, I became consciously one with the mind of that lady who liked the infinite way, one with the mind of Henry Thomas Hamblin, one with the mind of George Allen and Unwin, and eventually one with the mind of you that brought you here. For surely you know that it was no human activity of mine that brought you here. It is a spiritual bond that exists between us and one that I did not create, one that was created for us first because my conscious oneness with God, the mind of God, made me one with the spiritual mind of everyone all around the world who is seeking spiritual harmony, spiritual grace. Remember, I have not attracted to me those who are looking for loaves and fishes. I have not attracted to me those who are here for selfish or personal motives. This message has attracted unto itself those who are seeking also truth or the mind that was in Christ Jesus. Therefore, my conscious oneness with the mind of God has made me one with every individual in England and Holland and Germany and Switzerland and Africa and Australia and New Zealand and the United States and Canada. Wherever there is a mind attuned to God, sooner or later they are drawn to the message of the infinite way. I could go on and explain to you 
that my conscious oneness with God has drawn to me the finances to carry this message around the world, to finance it around the world, to be able to share with students in every country, regardless of whether or not they had the money to pay for it, and brought them to where eventually they did have the money to pay for it. In other words, money in sufficient quantities has been attracted to this message without the use of human means, without memberships, without organization, without advertising, to carry this work forward. This too has been through conscious oneness with God. And so it is, I have drawn unto myself companionship and home and students and publishers, everything necessary to the unfoldment of the message of the infinite way and have done it without leaving my home, without leaving my office, without leaving any place, just sitting in quietness and in confidence, in meditation, until this click took place and then discovered all of these great miracles that have happened to us all around the world. So we have drawn to us publishers in England, in the United States, in Germany, and uh, soon French. So just imagine then why it is that the basis of this message is become consciously one with your source which really is closer to you than breathing, you don't have to go anywhere for it. The kingdom of God is within you. And therefore, it is in the silence, in your meditation, in your inner peace, that you make this contact, feel the presence, and then find that an invisible presence has gone out before you to make the crooked places straight to straighten out all the problems of your life, physical, mental, moral, financial, whatever they may be, human relationships. This presence goes before you to provide protection, whether you're in the air or on the ground or on the water or beneath the water. This presence goes before you to attract to you those persons, those circumstances, those conditions, necessary to the fulfillment of your harmonious, joyous, successful life on earth. A thousand may fall at your left, ten thousand at your right. It will not come nigh thy dwelling place if your dwelling place is God. Now, all of this is difficult. Let me assure you of this from the beginning, that it is difficult. It is so difficult that the Master said, few there be that enter. The reason is this. There must be a sufficient devotion to God, to spirit, to the invisible, that which to sense is intangible. There must be enough devotion, enough longing, thirsting, or hungering for it that one is willing to sacrifice. Now, the Master said, you must leave all for me. The Master said, you must be willing even to leave mother, father, sister, and brother for my sake. The Master said, when you find this pearl, sell all that you have in order to purchase it. In other words, he showed very clearly that he did not believe that the kingdom of God was to be gotten easily, lightly, through shortcuts, 
or with spare time or spare change. It is for this purpose that of old they inaugurated the teaching of tithing. Now, you can readily understand this, that if your teacher or your teaching were revealed to you as uh, living in India or Tibet or California, that in some way or other you would have to make the demonstration of getting there to your teacher and your teaching, and it would be folly to sit around crying, I haven't enough money, or I have to attend a wedding or a funeral, or I must stay home to keep my husband company. None of this would do once it was revealed to you where your teacher is. You would be under compulsion of going there. And then it would be up to you to be so consciously one with God that all of the interferences, the lack of money would dissolve and there would be an abundance of money. The human relationships would adjust themselves and you would be free to go. Everything would take place for you, but you would have to have the degree of devotion necessary that would make you say, in spite of all obstacles, I am going. Well, so it is, when you draw to yourself a teacher, the expense is far less, the time involved is far less, the sacrifices are far less, and so you have very little of this world's goods to share or to part with. So the tithing in that direction becomes a very insignificant matter. But there is another tithing, and I guess this is where the great difficulty comes in, the tithing of time. There are 24 hours in a day, and you owe two and one-half hours of this to God. That is your tithe. How are you going to divide your day so as to give two and one-half hours to God? Do not think for a moment that you are going to take the kingdom of God with less time than that. Fortunate are you if you attain it with that. Therefore comes the sacrifice. The alarm clock must be set for 15 minutes or a half hour earlier than is usual. Fifteen minutes must be taken from the lunch period. Well, many people believe that with a half-hour lunchtime they can't take fifteen minutes from it, but I have been demonstrating for a great many years that a full meal can be eaten in twenty minutes, a full meal from course to course, and a half meal in ten or twelve minutes easily. And therefore, there is no such thing as an excuse for anyone not having 15 minutes at their lunchtime and at their dinner time, before or after. In that case, then, there remains only one and a half hours to be distributed between dinner time and breakfast time. Well, you see how easy that is. All you have to do is eliminate the radio or television, and it's done. It's really done, that simply. And not only that it's done that simply, but you provide for yourself less of material sense to overcome, because by the time you get through with an hour and a half of television, you must be ready to go out and commit crimes. 
certainly it's as maddening over here as it is with us. I've heard it here too. And it is maddening. And therefore, to get back on the beam is that much more difficult. At any rate, this must be clear to us that the kingdom of God is not lying around waiting for us to pick it up easily or through shortcuts. And therefore, sacrifice is involved. And whether it is the tithing of our income or the tithing of our time or the tithing of service, in one way or another, be assured that you will get from the kingdom of God what you carry to the kingdom of God in your devotion, in your love, in your hunger, in your thirst after righteousness. Now, there is a reason for all of this, the reason also that accounts for much that you read in the message of the infinite way. Humanly, there are many ways of changing your life or the experiences of your life. These are so difficult that few people ever attain them. But once you start on the spiritual path, you will find this. There is no way of changing an appearance or an effect in your life, a condition or a person, without changing your own consciousness. In other words, it is impossible to reform the other fellow. It is impossible to make the other fellow spiritual or honest. It is impossible to remove the inequalities, the injustices, the competitions from out here. The only way we can do it is change our consciousness and these conditions out here dissolve out of our experience. Now let me show you how that works. And this is going to be hard medicine. Just as hard as when the Master said, by their fruits ye shall know them. As ye sow, so shall ye reap. Do you ever stop to think what hard medicine that is to swallow? That what you are reaping is what you have sown? Ah, oh, no. None of us likes to face that. Each one of us loves to blame someone else, or some two or three or four, or some group, or our parents or grandparents, or circumstances or conditions. I can't help really, I can't help smiling, but sometimes almost laughing out loud when I read some of these psychological treaties that explain to us how these men in prison are there because uh, they had no opportunity as children. They were born in a ghetto or a slum, or they had very little education, or uh, they had some other handicap in life. Of course, you know, in order for a psychologist to say that, he has to hide the truth from you, that the really successful people in life all came from that kind of an environment. The really successful people all came from lack of opportunity and lack of education and slum districts and ghetto districts and poor districts. The really successful men and women have fought their way up through every kind of a handicap 
and they have to hide this from you too. There are just as many rich men's sons and well-born men's sons in prison or deserving to be there. There are just as many rich men's sons and daughters, failures in life, as poor men's sons and daughters. So that all of that psychological nonsense is just that. It is nonsense. As ye sow, so shall ye reap. And if you sow to the flesh, you will reap corruption. And if you sow to the spirit, you will reap life everlasting. And if you don't like those statements, resign from your Christian church. And tell them you don't like it, then don't believe it, and they can keep Jesus Christ locked up. Because remember, although it was voiced centuries before the Master, it was certainly voiced by him. As ye sow, so shall ye reap. Now, this really means that what we are demonstrating in life represents our state of consciousness. It represents our degree of either spiritual awareness or lack of spiritual awareness. It really means that we are demonstrating our not being under the law of God or we are demonstrating being under the law of God. Either we are demonstrating life by might and by power or we are demonstrating life by thy spirit. And that's just what it comes down to, and that is just, again, the fabric of the message of the infinite way, that you need not start changing the outer circumstances of your life, and it's folly to, to start to change the people in your life, begin to change your own consciousness and you will soon find that the people and the circumstances and the conditions of life change for you. We had such a, uh, an outstanding example of this recently in a hotel where there was a an employee of the hotel who had to come in contact with the guests uh, very regularly throughout the day. And this man's nature and his attitude and bearing toward the guests of the hotel was such that you couldn't possibly have given him a tip if you had wanted to. You'd have been ashamed of yourself, feeling it was just pure bribery the man actually discouraged you from tipping him, rewarding him, being gracious to him by his attitude toward you. Now, heaven knows why, but that was his attitude, and I know for certain that it must have been reflected in his earnings. Wherefore, it was noted that another man in the same hotel invariably had a smile, invariably was asking if he could be of service, was invariably making himself gracious so that I doubt that anyone could have limited their tip or their gratuity to him to just whatever the normal percentage might have been. It would have been impossible to resist giving this man a gift. Who made it? The guests or the worker? And so it is with many of us in our work. Very often we make it impossible for our employer or partner 
or employee to be gracious to us. We ourselves do that by our attitude to them. Whereas, the very moment we begin to perceive that the kingdom of God is in every individual and regardless of what they may seem to be at this moment poor or rich high or low sick or well remember that they have the same father we have call no man on earth your father there is but one father this one that is in heaven and the moment you begin to acknowledge that God is the father of mankind, you begin to act differently toward others and you literally compel them to act differently toward you because your recognition of the brotherhood that exists between all of us, regardless of our color, race, nationality, regardless of our education or lack of it, there is but one Father in this universe, one Creator, and every one of us is of that same Father. We are of the same household of God. Perhaps as you sit in this room, it seems very easy for you to accept this relationship existing between us here but I can assure you that it will do you no good as the master said it profiteth you nothing to pray for your friends you must pray for your enemies and so I assure you that merely to look around this room and say ah oh, yes we are all brothers and sisters and we are of the household of God for we have one father this is useless it is when you leave this room and go outside and begin to meet everybody at every level of society, every level of color, race, creed, religion, and nationality, and secretly and silently within yourself remember, just think, he has the same father I have. I have the same father he has or she. Therefore, we be brethren. Think what this does the moment you utter it in silence, in secrecy, because these are things that must never be spoken. They must only be held secretly within your consciousness, and everyone out here will feel it. It is the prayer that is uttered in the silence of your being that God rewards openly. That which you voice openly costs you the grace of God, loses for you the grace of God. Therefore, in your relationships with each other, only by secretly and silently maintaining within yourself there is but one Father, there is but one God, there is but one family, and we are all one. Maintain that and watch within an hour how the attitude of people in the world begins to change toward you. You won't have to wait years for this. You won't have to wait to die and go to heaven. Within hours or days, you will begin to perceive that men and women will act differently toward you. They will feel something in you. And the something that they feel in you is that love which you have expressed in accepting them into your family, into your spiritual household, into your consciousness. Now, this, you see, involves a change of consciousness on your part. You have to change from believing 
that Christians are better than Jews or Christians are better than Vedantists and so forth and so on. You have to stop believing that whites are better than blacks. You have to stop believing that employers are better than employees. You have to stop <coughs> believing that we are anything other than children of God, all of us, all throughout the world. As you do this, you are changing your concept of mankind. You are changing your consciousness and the world out here begins to change to you. Now, in this same way then, You have to change your concept, your consciousness of supply. The world believes that supply is getting something. The opposite of this is true. Supply is giving, sharing, cooperating. And the more we give and the more we share and the more we cooperate, the more bread we have cast upon the water, the more bread there is to return to us. Therefore, we have to begin consciously to change our consciousness so that instead of looking to our friends and relatives for love and cooperation and friendship and loans and patience, we have to start giving love, friendship, sharing, patience, cooperation. Instead of looking to them to overlook our faults, we must begin to overlook their faults and to forgive them 70 times 7. In other words, we must consciously reverse the human picture that believes that you owe me something, I must recognize that I owe you. And then I must begin to find how I can share with you that which I owe you. And whether I'm sharing truth or patience or forgiveness, cooperation, whatever it may be, whatever I am sharing with you, is the absolute measure of that which comes back to me. If I do not change my consciousness on the subject of supply to where I begin to understand that I must not look for reward or payment, I must earn it. I must give service, I must give smiles, I must give help, and I must give cheerfulness, joyfulness, confidence. And in the proportion, the measure of my giving, does the bread that I cast upon the water come back to me? But if I do not change my consciousness of supply, I will never change the supply itself. So it is with evil. Now everyone fears evil, everyone fears disease, everyone fears death, everyone fears accident. But until they stop it, they're going to experience it. There's only one way in which you can stop fearing evil of any nature. There is only way in which you can stop fearing lack and limitation. There is only way in which you can stop fearing the other driver on the road. There is only way in which you can stop fearing the alcoholic. Just one way. You have to change your consciousness from what you now believe about God to where 
you accept God as omnipotence, the all power. Now this is difficult. We have been born and brought up to fear evil conditions in this world. We have been born and brought up to fear talking to strangers lest they kidnap us. We have been taught to fear to leave our doors unlocked lest someone come in and rob us. All life is built up of fearing something or fearing somebody, and yet how glibly on Sunday we sing psalms to O oh God Almighty, Almighty God, Almighty Power. Then all week long, fear something or somebody. Right now it's a little stylish to fear Russia. Before that it was stylish to fear Germany and Japan. In the human picture there will always be somebody to fear and something to fear. And don't doubt for a minute that these other countries are being taught to fear us. We don't think we're terrible, but they do. Why? They are being taught that we are terrible and that we are to be feared. And so nonsensically, they fear us when we have nothing but the best of will. So then, it becomes necessary to actually change your consciousness. You have to consciously accept the God of omnipotence, all power. And once you accept the God of all power, you can then say, I shall not fear man whose breath is in his nostril. I shall not fear what mortal man can do to me. Why? I have a God of omnipotence, of all power, and in the all power of God, I fear no other powers. Ah, yes. Easily said, not easily attained. Therefore, I have said to you, it is not easy. It takes at least two and a half hours of your day to build a new consciousness, one which now fears nothing and nobody, a consciousness which now knows that it must give instead of looking to receive, a consciousness which now looks upon mankind with a smile. Thou art my brother. There is but one Father, the one in heaven your father and my father. As we change our consciousness, we find the outer world changing its nature toward us. This is the whole foundation of the message of the infinite way. The in message of the infinite way doesn't say that it is going to miraculously bring you health or wealth or peace or ease, it does promise you that if you will devote yourself to a change of consciousness, that your changed consciousness will appear outwardly as changed human conditions. You don't have to advertise what you're doing. On the contrary, you have to keep it locked up within yourself and let the invisible presence go before you to make the crooked places straight. Let this invisible presence go before you to draw unto you all that makes for your completeness, your perfection, your harmony, your well-being. Our work then is really that of changing our concepts so that we now know the truth about God and God's omnipotence, that we know the truth about our neighbor, 
as children of the same father that we are, therefore of the same household of God. We change our concept of supply and know the truth that supply consists of what we can pour out into this world in the way of loving our neighbor as ourself. And you will find that tithing of your time, the giving of two and a half hours of your day to the work of changing your consciousness will pay greater dividends than any other investment you can make in either time or money or service.